Hugh Hewitt, President of the Richard Nixon Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome you today to this commemoration of the 109th anniversary of our 37th President of the United States, Richard Nixon. Because of restrictions placed on public events due to COVID, we are holding this ceremony virtually. Yet nothing can dampen our enthusiasm for celebrating President Nixon's birthday. We are pleased to open these ceremonies today by honoring America as the Navy, bound, Navy Band Southwest is joining us remotely to play our national anthem. Thank you very much for that stirring rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. I know that President Nixon, a proud Navy veteran, would have appreciated your participation very much, and as you do as you play for us later today. I'm standing just steps away from the house in which Richard Nixon was born on January 9, 1913, and one of the coldest days ever recorded in the history of Orange County's town, Yorba Linda. The President famously opened his memoirs, RN, with the sentence, I was born in a house my father built. And we honor President Nixon today as we do each year on this date for the nation and the world which he built over the course of his life. During his service as a member of the Congress, a senator, the vice president, and as president of the United States and a respected elder statesman, Richard Nixon dedicated himself to advancing the great cause of peace and national security and freedom here and abroad. Although he left the presidency nearly 50 years ago, we still live in a world that Richard Nixon did so much to build. His legacy of service is a cause greater than himself and will continue to inspire people far into the future. Today, in the shadow of the house in which he was born and at the place where he and his beloved First Lady Pat Nixon were laid to rest, we mark the President's birthday with the laying of a wreath from the President of the United States. We are grateful to have with us in person Lieutenant, Co Lieutenant Colonel Brian Mulhern, Commander of the United States Army Southern California Recruiting Battalion, to lay the wreath in President Nixon's honor. Colonel Mulhern is accompanied by Command Sergeant Major Winston Castillo and Captain Logan Belitho. Gentlemen, thank you for being here and for your service to our nation. Thank you, Colonel Mulhern, Command Sergeant Major Castillo, and Captain Belitho. Our distinguished speaker today, Rear Admiral Bette Bolivar, is coming to us virtually. Admiral Bolivar is a 1985 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. She is the commander of the United States Navy Southwest Region. 
A graduate of the United States Naval Academy, Admiral Balabar has served in various leadership positions around the world, both at sea and on shore. As a certified deep sea diver, she served on five Navy salvage ships, including as commander of the USS Salvor and a deployment to Afghanistan to support Operation Enduring Freedom. Among her shore duties was a stint as a researcher and writer on the Secretary of the Navy's White House staff, which I'm sure gives her an appreciation for the challenges that every president faces every day. She is following in the footsteps of the Navy's very first female admiral to achieve flag rank, Admiral Arlene B. Dirk, whose promotion to admiral was approved by President Nixon in 1972. I know that President Nixon would have been proud of the number of women achieving flag rank that has grown ever since her promotion and would undoubtedly add to those he hopes for the members to continue in that today. Admiral Bolivar, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me join you today. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Petty Officer Patrick Melton and the Navy Band Southwest for playing our national anthem. Thanks to them, we are able to properly start the special event. It is my absolute pleasure to be with you this morning, even if I'm unable to be with you in person or live. COVID has brought a lot of challenges, hardship, and change to many of us. However, we've also been able to adapt and overcome by leveraging technology to stay connected. I'd like to take a few moments to talk about President Nixon's life. Then we'll hear an impressive musical performance from our ambassadors in blue, Navy Band Southwest, led by Lieutenant Commander Bruce Manfield. Patriot, President, Peacemaker. President Richard Nixon's life is truly an American story. Nixon's early life was marked by hardship, and he later quoted a saying of President Eisenhower's to describe his boyhood. We were poor, but the glory of it was we didn't know it. Many of us here today have experienced similar challenges and the rewards of hard work, keeping up with schoolwork, struggling with paying bills, raising families, military service, giving our best efforts and hopes for a better life. Nixon was a grocer's son who got ahead by working harder and longer than anyone else. During World War II, he served on active duty, commissioned as an ensign in the United States Navy. Nixon was a powerful national figure for 30 years. He was president at a time in our history when Americans were tempted to say, we have had enough of the world. Instead, he knew we had to reach out to old friends and old enemies alike. He would not allow America to quit the world. Today, we can look back at this little house and still imagine a young boy sitting by the window of the attic. Looking out to the world, he could then himself only imagine. Richard Nixon's life is a testament that public service is a noble calling. In closing, I want to personally thank all of you for attending today's ceremony. So without further ado, allow me to introduce to you a very special group of sailors, the Navy Band Southwest. May God bless our men and women in uniform, and hoo may God bless our great country, the United States of America. Hello, I'm Chief Musician John Wheeler from Navy Band Southwest. We are pleased to join you virtually to celebrate the birthday of our country's 37th president, Richard M. Nixon. Navy Band Southwest is comprised of 45 sailors stationed in San Diego, California, and we are proud to provide musical support to the entire southwestern United States. It is now our privilege to present to you the performance of our brass quintet, brass quartet, woodwind quintet, and ceremonial band. Please enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
John Philip Sousa is an American composer best known for his military marches. In addition to writing marches, he served as a musician and conductor in the Marine Corps and the Navy. Here is our ceremonial band performing Sousa's Washington Post. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Admiral Bolivar, for your inspiring remarks. And thank you, too, to the Navy Region Southwest Band. We hope that the, by the time President Nixon's 109th birthday comes around next year, we will be able to welcome you here in person to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in person in your Belinda soon.
Good morning, and welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library in Yorba Linda. I'm Jim Byron, Executive Vice President of the Richard Nixon Foundation. Behind me is President Nixon's birthplace, a humble white farmhouse built by his father, from which a young man rose to the presidency of the United States. Not far behind him in life was another young man who grew up in Southern California, a box boy at Ralph's Grocery, who used his innate intellect, friendly personality, and warm smile to become one of the most significant and influential conservative thinkers in American history. His name was Bruce Hershenson, and Bruce passed away on November 30th at 88. Bruce was a fixture in American politics for decades, a former White House official, a brilliant artist, storyteller, historian, and dear friend and longtime confidant of President Nixon and his family. And it was Bruce's family that announced his passing last month by issuing the following statement. It is with a heavy heart that we announce the passing of our beloved Bruce. Bruce passed away at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles on Monday, November 30th, 2020. He was 88 years old. Bruce was born on September 10th, 1932 in Milwaukee. Bruce's parents moved the family to Los Angeles when he was a young boy. Bruce lived a very full life as an award-winning film producer and director, politician, radio and TV personality, award-winning author, and professor. He served four presidents, including John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson at the United States Information Agency, Richard Nixon as a deputy special assistant to the president, and Ronald Reagan as a valued member of his presidential transition team. He ran for the United States Senate from California in 1986, and again in 1992, where he was the Republican nominee. Bruce served as a distinguished fellow at the Claremont Institute, along with being a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge. He taught politics at the University of Maryland, Whittier College, and most recently at Pepperdine University School of Public Policy. He is survived by his sister, Lee Logan, and his longtime partner and soulmate, Janet Bresnahan along with countless friends around the world. Bruce was an integral part of the fabric of the Nixon Foundation for more than 30 years, leading so many programs, speaking, planning, teaching, always teaching. So today, we're honored to lead tributes to President Nixon's friend, Bruce Hershenson, in this memorial that will live online forever. Welcome, everyone. I'm Hugh Hewitt, the President and CEO of the Richard Nixon Library Foundation in Yorba Linda, California. And I am so pleased to welcome four of my friends today to help us honor Bruce Hershenson. If you didn't know Bruce, that is your loss. And if you did, you'll be watching because he was a lifelong friend to so many thousands of people and tens of thousands of people over the radio. And we've gathered at the Nixon Library today four of his closest associates over the last many years. Bruce was born a couple of months before FDR was elected to his first term 
He died only weeks after Joe Biden was elected to his 20 day presidential election. I think Bruce had very strong opinions on each and every one of them, which he shared with everyone in Southern California, often throughout his broadcast career and with his students. Uh, I want, though, to have the people who knew him best remember him for you. We're joined today by two of the United States leading political consultants, Arnie Steinberg, who not only began his career helming the campaign of James Buckley in New York when he elect was elected an upset win in the first Jim Buckley election, but also went on to write two of the most important graduate school books on political consulting. Ken Kachigian is with us. Ken worked in the White House with President Nixon and Bruce Hershenson. He also was the key speechwriter for Ronald Reagan, served with President Nixon in his retirement, went on to serve with George Duke Majin, Pete Wilson, actually the lion of a successful Republican politics is what I like to say in California. And he managed Bruce Hershenson's ill-fated but nevertheless inspired 1992 senatorial campaign. Dean Pete Peterson joins us today as well from Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, with which Bruce was associated for so many years and from which so many of Bruce's students and friends have graduated and gone on to worlds of public service. And it would not be a Bruce Hershenson tribute without one of his colleagues on the airwaves of Southern California for the entire time that Bruce was on, Mark Larson, now at 760 in San Diego, a longtime friend of mine and everyone who enjoys good radio. So if it's possible, I'd like to begin with you, Arnie, and we're gonna go around the horn and ask each of you to share just a few minutes about what was best and perhaps little least known about Bruce Hershenson. Arnie Steinberg. Well, you've all heard the term gentleman and scholar, and you know, Bruce really was a consummate uh, gentleman, as Ken will tell you when he discusses the race against Barbara Boxer, how Bruce behaved uh, civilly and as a gentleman throughout, despite the fact that uh, he, that was not reciprocated. And he was a scholar never having gone to college. He basically had an encyclopedia knowledge of just about everything. Uh, he was uh, absolutely faithful to historical facts and uh, was a creative uh, genius uh, there. You know, when you think about Bill Bennett's book of virtues, that was Bruce, whether you're talking about perseverance or loyalty or hard work, you go through the entire book of virtues and they all apply to Bruce Hershenson. Uh, I, when I was thinking about getting ready for this, I was about to put on a coat and tie like all of you, and I thought, well, what about Bruce? And here was a guy so unpretentious in every way that though his films were methodic in their creative detail, whether it was the music or the camera shot, Bruce as a personal, as a guy, was just so uh, unpretentious and, and ordinary, not an ordinary man, but an exceptional human being. But, you know, he ate uh, simple food, fast food all the time there. He didn't really care how he dressed. When he was running for office, you'd have to say, well, that doesn't quite match. So, but he looked at his movies, they were entirely different. The color was absolutely right. Uh, and that was Bruce. And he was an unlikely candidate. You know, I, I'll talk to you about how I first met him. But this was a guy who was really kind of a shy, retiring guy, almost a recluse. Even though he was a friend of mine, we didn't see him very often. I would invite him to my kids' bar mitzvahs and events yeah. there, and he wouldn't come, not because he didn't like me, he came to the house a number of times. He just wasn't that social a guy. Uh, <laughs> and and, and it, it was a, a, a paradox uh, uh, there. And uh, I'm sure Ken will have things to say about uh, Bruce is a guy you would have wanted to appoint it to office there because he's the kind of a guy, as you said, now, Bruce, you're going to this room and these people disagree with your position on pro-life. So talk about other things. If they ask you a question, be honest as you are and so on. He'd go in and start the speech talking about pro-life. He wanted to make clear how he, how, how he, how he felt uh, there. Uh, you know, uh, I have to tell you that when he used to do a radio commentary years later in KBC radio, and I'd be calling in the evening sometime and be not that late say, I gotta go to bed. Uh, I got the commentary in the morning. I said, well, Bruce, that's not till 7.30. And he said, yeah, but I get up at 3.30. Uh, this was before the internet. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm, I'm getting a hold of all the newspapers and, and, and listening to the radio. I want to make it as current as possible. He took so much pride in everything he did in the radio uh, broadcast epitomized that. It was in 1968 when the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia. I was in Young Americans for Freedom, a leader with David Keene in New York, it occurred. Marvin Liebman, who was the closest friend of Bill Buckley, and immediately organized a committee with uh, David. And then uh, Marvin said, well, it was a favor, return favor to me. Um, Jim Buckley is running for the Senate, uh, and Bobby Kennedy had died, and, and uh, Charlie Goodell was going to be appointed in November uh, for two years later. But this was the Jacob Javits seat, and it was kind of a suicide run. And said, can you get Jim some publicity on Czechoslovakia? I did. First time I met Jim Buckley. 
those two events, meeting Jim Buckley and the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, were precursors to my relationship with Bruce Hershenson a short time uh, later. Uh, in 1970, uh, uh, in 1968, uh, Richard Nixon was running for president, and uh, Frank Shakespeare was involved, Roger Ailes was involved. And in 1970, the, just before the election of Jim Buckley, Roger Ailes volunteered his time and we did a statewide telethon when I met uh, Roger. Bill Buckley was close to Frank Shakespeare and uh, Frank was appointed head of the U.S. Information Agency. He inherited Bruce Hershenson. Unbeknownst to me at that time, uh, Bruce had uh, gone into, uh, he'd been a master at RTO. He became an independent documentary producer under contract with USIA. And he wound up doing a, a film on the Jackie Kennedy's trip to India. JFK was so impressed that he started getting even more business from the USIA. And when uh, uh, President Kennedy was assassinated, the Kennedy family requested him, and he did the film, The Eight Years of Lightning, The Day of Drums, the only film given an exemption by the law to be shown in the United States. Um, I would later see films that were done under Bruce's reign uh, during the uh, years, uh, the, the Johnson years uh, there. And they kind of reflected uh, uh, JFK and reflected the kind of thinking we now think today. They were incredibly anti-communist. Uh, there was Eulogy to 502, a libertarian film about one minute of freedom around the world. Uh, there was the Five Cities of June that covered a, a new pope and, 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 and different uh, events there that happened all in one month. There was Barricade on the Berlin Wall there uh, where he went with JFK and covered JFK's speech uh, there. Uh, Bruce was of that old school with Frank Shakespeare and later Bill Casey and the CIA real hardcore anti-communist there. So when you talk about earlier about what would happen to today, uh, we know where Bruce would be in today's uh, battle uh, there. He was absolutely uncompromising. And so when Bruce was at USI, I met him in 1971 working for Senator uh, Buckley. I was then on Capitol Hill there. And I saw Czechoslovakia. And uh, that's a subject in itself because it won an Academy Award for Best Short Documentary. Those are the days when Hollywood was liberal but not left, and they could a a award an Academy Award to a film like that. I think it's the best American propaganda film ever made, maybe one of the best propaganda films ever. I won't talk about it for lack of time. But what happened is that uh, the law said you cannot show uh, any USIA materials within the borders of the United States for fear that it would be propaganda. So I got the USIA general counsel to say that my constituent reports for Senator Buckley could be exempt because they were official communication. And so I had in New York 12 TV stations that showed a half hour constituent report every month that I produced. So in this one, I put in this, the film on Czechoslovakia, which ran 13 minutes. It's an incredible film and an interview with Bruce. During the course of the interview, Bruce uh, pretty much insulted Senator Fulbright, who was then chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, so after it was shot in the basement of Capitol Hill there, in the studios there, I said uh, in more drawn out language, I think we should redo this, to Senator, Senator Buckley, you know, because of senatorial courtesy. And I said, and Bruce, I really don't want you harmed. Well, after a long discussion, Senator Buckley, who, who somebody who may know him uh, now, as of this rating, he's 95 years old. Uh, the senator said, well, listen, if that's the way Bruce feels, I don't want to uh, edit that out. And Bruce said, well, it's not going to harm the senator. He doesn't care. Keep it in. Well, predictably, New York Times, Washington Post ran a major story, and uh, Frank Shakespeare said to Bruce, look, you've got to apologize or we won't get our budget. Bruce said, I will not apologize. I was truthful. He's stupid. He's naive uh, there. So Frank said, well, i got to fire you. He fired him. Bruce called me up, so I got fired. I felt terrible. And he said, uh, can you find something for me to do? Uh, I, I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't have a lot of savings and so on. And I said, well, I don't. He said, can you uh, find speaking? He was not in the conservative movement then. And so I called people, they never heard of him there. And I said, this is a great guy, great speaker, got a story to tell. And Bruce began the speaking circuit. So he was getting the feeds there. That was kind of his entree into the movement. And uh, you know, a while later, uh, he worked for President uh, uh, Nixon. He was uh, very involved in things like uh, the, 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 uh, the Yom Kippur War. And I had put Bruce in touch with a friend of mine who had started the movement in the late 50s. Uh, he'd been in prison for five years in the Soviet Union for liberation of, of Soviet Jews. He later came to the United States and he and Bruce had uh, one thing in common. They both thought President Nixon was a genius. And one of the things they agreed upon is even though Bruce was so associated with nationalist China and Formosa and so bitterly anti-communist China, he accepted my friend Roman Brockman's analysis, which to abbreviate was that this was a masterstroke against 
uh, the Soviet Union because the Soviets hated the communist Chinese. There was a lot of racism involved there. And I, he was right. When I was in Soviet Union in 1979, they were still bitter over it. Uh, there. So that was kind of a master uh, a stroke. Uh, I would uh, uh, also like to say that, that, that the only time the USA ever got its budget was after what Bruce did because Senator Fulbright was saying so cocky he agreed to a parliamentary maneuver where there could be no amendments to the second degree. So he introduced an amendment to cut the USI budget by 25%, and it would specify all the programs that were anti-communist. He wanted to keep the libraries, all the benign stuff, and cut out the hardcore stuff there. And no amendments to the second degree meant somebody couldn't say, let's cut it by 20% or 15 or 12. So faced with a, 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 a draconian 25% cut in the full, the only time in its history he got the full budget, which was the irony of what, uh, uh, what Bruce had done. Uh, Bruce, I, I just want to say that there, there's no way I can pay justice to him as a genuine mensch, a, a, a human being there. And, it, and it, were, it was at odds. People saw that in his public arena, but they didn't see the sensitivity and the uh, deep personal empathy he felt for his friends and his loyalty uh, there. That just did not come across. They saw a hard debater, uh, you know, uh, no holds barred uh, there. Uh, he, he went for the gut debate, not at a personal level, but on an issue level there, uncompromising. We almost worked together on many projects. Uh, I was going to go back with him when he was going to head USIA, but Wick got the, got, got the job. He did an okay job. Bruce would have done a phenomenal job there. He was going to bring Russell Kirk's book, The Roots of Conservatism to, to Life. It didn't get funding. And he was going to do something with Solson Easton. And he came back to me after meeting with Solson Easton and said, I can't work with this guy uh, there. And he so much uh, wanted that. I, I have to tell uh, all of you who are watching who are not familiar with Bruce, that this is a renaissance man of all seasons there, a writer, an editor, a columnist, a director, a producer. He did the music for his movies uh, there, a public speaker, a novelist uh, there. And all of that, uh, and despite the fact that he didn't have a family, didn't have children, you know, he so cared about my, my kids uh, at a personal level. And my, my wife, who's met many, many politicians, often cynical of many of them, because in 30 seconds, she can sort of see through them uh, uh, there, because so many of them have kind of a public veneer. With Bruce, what you saw was what you got. And uh, w w when this session was opened by you, he said it's unfortunate those of you didn't know him. And that is not was not hyperbole. It really is uh, the, the case. He's that combination of if, if you're young, you don't know this, but there was once Reader's Digest that was in every dentist's office and doctor's office. They had the, my most unforgettable person I met or whatever. That's the kind of person uh, uh, Bruce uh, was. And if he had been elected to the U.S. Senate, you would have seen a, a 19th century kind of order, somebody who... The gal people would have come into the galleries once again to hear this guy uh, 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 speak. And I'm just honored to be part of paying tribute to him. Arnie, thank you. And, and that's a great transition to our friend Ken Kachian. Uh, Ken, of course, is a partner now with Brownstein Hyatt and doing all the sort of lawyering things on both coasts. But I got to know him uh, when he was working for Richard Nixon and preparing the president for the Frost, Nixon Frost interviews and helping him with a memoir. But then I really got to know Ken when Bruce ran for Senate in 1992. And we all win and we all lose in politics, but probably the toughest loss outside of presidential campaigns had to be that Senate campaign. And Ken, tell us about that. Tell us about Bruce. And uh, you knew him as well as anyone. Ken Kachigian. Thanks. Thanks, you, And thanks, Arnie. Uh, well, <clears throat> we're going to repeat the, a lot of uh, these tributes today. Uh, we're going to have some of the same stories. I don't think, Hugh, I don't think uh, Bruce would approve of this event today. Uh, I could easily picture him pacing back and forth, <laughs> puffing on a cigarette, and wondering why we weren't using our time for better use to talk about the continuing Russian threat to Medi's peace and for how the expansion of government undermines our personal rights. Uh, that would be typical of Bruce. Uh, he would never want attention on himself only on policies which determine the future of our freedoms. I assume others will speak today of Bruce's devotion to public policy and the, the great issues of, about which you felt so deeply. Uh, I want to spend my time talking mostly about his personal qualities. Uh, I got my first taste of those in uh, 1973 when Bruce and I were among those very few in August uh, of 1973, who thought uh, President Nixon 
should not have resigned. Uh, I could only write a memo uh, there in the late August days, uh, wanting, asking president not to resign. But uh, some of you know that Bruce fought his way into the president's private study on August 7th, begging him, imploring him not to resign. He felt so strongly. And until Bruce took his last breath, no one dared challenge Bruce uh, regarding uh, um, Bruce's, uh, regarding president's tenure in office and uh, or challenge Bruce about his, uh, 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 President Nixon's time in office to, to, to the president's very end. So what, what quality does this speak of? It speaks to loyalty. And think about that in today's world, when you see the betrayal of alliances and friendships all over, when the idea of keeping one's word uh, is no longer an absolute, uh, no longer an absolute solemn pledge. Bruce's loyalty to his president, to his country, to his family and to his friends were never in question in his lifetime. So that, that uh, a notion of loyalty and uh, uh, is one thing I want everybody to think about. Then there's another trait he had in abundance, and that is, uh, and Arnie mentioned this, is friendship. I love to watch Bruce uh, debate John Tunney on television when uh, the two of them had their regular KBC program. He was so tenacious. I thought the two of them were going to get into a fight. They're going to start striking each other. But um, as uh, very few of you know, Bruce and John Tunney became very great personal friends. And Bruce would do anything for John Tunney on a personal basis. And they shared a unique warmth off the debate set that viewers never saw. And for those of you watching this, uh, this program who had the privilege of knowing Bruce, you know exactly what I mean. He was always your pal, no matter what the situation was. And whatever you shared with him, Bruce kept his word, no matter what. Then there was his integrity. That's another trait I want you to think about with Bruce. Bruce was immovable on his commitment to ideals and positions. He devoted his life to studying policies which advanced the goals of liberty and freedom for the country he loved and served. In that sense, he was never a partisan. He was only an American. And uh, uh, Arnie uh, discussed this briefly when he talked about uh, the uh, uh, abortion uh, movement. For example, when the found, uh, my, my uh, example is the Second Amendment. When the founders wrote the Second Amendment to the Constitution, for Bruce, it meant what it said, nothing more and nothing less. Bending views for political expediency for those who would be, uh, were, was for those who would betray their values, not Bruce. That many other value, uh, positions Bruce took as he wrote and taught and campaigned were, were not always expedient. Uh, believe me, <laughs> during the campaign in 1992, we struggled with that very often, but he did not live to be expedient. He lived to be faithful to his beliefs all the time, and that underscored his integrity. And so integrity is that trait that I want to underscore today as another value. And what a gentleman he was, and, and um, Arnie referred to this. Uh, I never once bru saw Bruce person without a coat and tie. I thought about doing this uh, uh, event uh, in shirt sleeves, and then I thought, oh my God, Bruce would go crazy. <laughs> coat and tie. So I put, a, put on a coat and tie. He had extraordinary manners in mixed company. And I, you know what? I never saw Bruce curse. And I, and I think he wore his coat and tie at home when he wrote. And I love seeing his precise handwriting. Those of you who saw his handwriting, he had a beautiful script, very neat and clean. And he did it with one of his dozens of pens that he loved to collect. He collected pens, many of them, uh, the old ink filled pens that marked another era. And yes, uh, Bruce personified another generation. But that quality of being a gentleman, uh, a real gentleman, is something I want to raise in tribute today about Bruce. Uh, many of us uh, can pause just for a bit today. Put down your iPhones and iPads and you young people out there. Put down your laptops in favor of writing out a few paragraphs of what it means to be a gentleman in a world of change. Finally, I have a couple of stories, personal stories, to complete my memories of Bruce. 
First, he shared with me how I could make a fortune in the food business. When Bruce wasn't having lunch at Musso and Frank's, his favorite restaurant, <laughs> he had the same lunch every day at home. He went to an Armenian deli in his Hollywood neighborhood, and he bought the Armenian version of pizza. It's called Lemajun. They look like a pizza on a different kind of dough with a more Middle Eastern type of spice ground meat topping. And Bruce loved them. And he would have two of them every day, topped by a cigarette, of course. <laughs> but because he, they were so flavorful and they were the Armenian version of pizza, uh, and he knew if he knew if they were only mass produced as pizza, I would make a small fortune in the food business. <laughs> he never stopped trying to convince me. Then there was the 1992 senatorial campaign. After I had successfully managed Dan Lundgren's 1990 Attorney General campaign, Bruce asked me to manage his uh, Senate race, but he had one condition. I could never require him to ask donors to raise money. Uh, so how the hell was I gonna raise two and a half million dollars <laughs> to run a successful campaign if he wouldn't ask them to raise money? But that was part of his integrity. But we compromised. He asked them in writing and we conducted one of the most successful uh, direct mail fundraising campaigns of the year. Uh, Bruce won the primary. And if George Bush had not conceded California in mid-October, and if the state Democratic Party had not spied on Bruce and conducted dirty tricks on him, he would have won that Senate seat. Still, his beloved sister Vi and his dear friend Jan and to his legion of friends who are watching this, we're left with a mountain of memories to cherish and extraordinary qualities that everyone watching today should strive to model. Bruce's incredible loyalty, faithful and unchanging. His embrace of friendship, always there to those around him. Next is unbending integrity. You're measured by your beliefs. And finally, Bruce, the ultimate gentleman, the very image of dignity in a time when we could surely use it. Thanks for letting me share those today. And that was wonderful. Thank you for that. I want to add, everyone deserves a friend like Bruce Hershenson. Uh, many of us watching know the late Tom Fuentes, who was the chairman of the Orange County Republican Party for so many years, very close friends with Bruce. And when Tom was ill and in the hospital getting a liver transplant, I believe Bruce somehow got from Hollywood to his hospital every single day, because that's what friends do when other friends are down. Bruce was really a friend indeed. And Pete Peterson, dean of the Graduate School of Public Policy at Pepperdine, I think that is perhaps why students flocked to him because he was a friend of them as well as a teacher. That's so right, Hugh. And let me just say at the top, it's such an honor to be a part of this August group, uh, remembering and celebrating an incredible man. Uh, I know Tom's son, TJ, is a part of this cloud of witnesses that we have here on this call, as well as Elise and uh, Jay Hoffman, who's been such a friend, not only he's been that connector really between the School of Public Policy and Bruce, and just great to have uh, this group assembled. Um, unlike the others here, I only got to know Bruce about 15 years ago, uh, although for reasons I'm gonna get into, it feels like I've known him for uh, 35 or 40 years. Uh, I first met Bruce as one of my own professors here at the Graduate Policy School of Pepperdine back in 2005. Uh, we then became colleagues here, both on faculty and teaching. And then when I became Dean, uh, he was uh, not only a friend, but somebody I welcomed here as a regular speaker and lecturer here at the policy school. But if I were to use one kind of phrase to describe Bruce in ways that I've come to appreciate him over the last several years is that he really is the most interesting man in the world. Uh, <laughs> it's not too much to say that um, my appreciation for his incredible life has only increased in recent years. You know, when you Google Bruce and you wanna find out a way to get to him, you will invariably land on the School of Public Policy website. And so on a regular basis, even though he was only coming to campus here a few times a year, we would get calls here at the office on a regular basis from a policy researcher or a historian or someone in the media looking to contact Bruce. And it was always about a story that I'd never heard of before. So 
I'm just going to break this out in a, in a couple different uh, ways, uh, because when I think of Bruce, I think about him as a as an evangelist for freedom, a storyteller of liberty, mm -hmm. and a teacher of leaders. And so first on the evangelist of freedom, this, this story is just a couple months old. We got a call at the office, as we invariably do, by a reporter from Rolling Stone who wanted to reach Bruce to talk about a story that this reporter was writing on a USIA-led tour of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, by Earth, Wind, and Fire that Bruce had somehow organized. Now, if there's a band and a man that you would think could not be polar opposites apart, <laughs> it's a 70s funk band, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Bruce Hershenson. But in the interest of evangelizing freedom, here was Bruce organizing a tour by Earth, Wind, and Fire of the Soviet Union. Uh, second story. Um, this, is, this is him being the storyteller of freedom. Uh, on the day that I learned that Bruce had passed, um, I ran into the founding dean here of the School of Public Policy, a gentleman by the name of Jim Wilburn. And we were just commiserating and talking about how much we missed him. And I, was, I, I asked, when was the first time that he had met Bruce? And it was back in uh, around 1973, 1974. Some of you might know, and it was mentioned before by Arnie, that um, Russell Kirk, the great conservative philosopher, uh, he had actually written his magnum opus, um, Roots of American Order, here on the Pepperdine campus. It was actually commissioned by Pepperdine University. And as part of that initial work, uh, Russell had always envisioned a movie, a documentary, a five-part documentary based on each one of the five cities that are the essential five roots of American order. And so who does he reach out to to write the screenplay for this book? But Bruce. So Bruce writes the five-part screenplay for this that's going to essentially outline the, the documentary for Roots of American Order. And Pepperdine then goes on this fundraising tour to attempt to gather the funds necessary to produce this documentary. The, the screenplay is still in our archives here at, at the School of Public Policy, which in and of itself just should be a, a follow-on reader uh, if you're not able to to read the entirety of Roots. And so Jim is talking about, Jim was head of fundraising for Pepperdine. He had gathered together this group of the Jonathan Club. It was 73 or 74. And Bruce is going to talk about this, uh, this important documentary, essentially outlining uh, Roots. And who is going to be the voiceover talent for this movie, but none other than the recent governor of California, Ronald Reagan. So. Here we are in uh, the Jonathan Club with Reagan and Bruce talking Roots of American Order to a group of about a dozen donors for a film project. And Bruce was a, a storyteller of freedom. He did that through his movies, but he did that also uh, through his books. And he taught here for uh, the better part of a dozen years. And the deal that Br uh, Bruce and I struck for the last five years of his life, was that anytime something was breaking around the world, particularly in an area in which he had particular expertise, which was, I think, everywhere except the South Pole, uh, he would say, he would give me two days notice and say, Pete, I want to come in, do a brown bag with the students. We'll set it up like one of our policy round tables, which he had done here for many years. And uh, we'll just, I'll ask her, answer questions and give some thoughts. And so, the last time I welcomed Bruce to campus was a year ago, and it was right in the midst of the riots in Hong Kong. And Bruce reached out and said, Pete, I'm ready to come in. Can you set a date, get the students together, anyone else who wants to come? Bruce arrives on campus and just holds forth for 45 minutes on the history of Hong Kong and why these riots and and China's movements are grounded in history that Bruce could tell just so beautifully. As it so happened, we do have Chinese graduate students here. And several of them in the room had never heard this history before, suffice it to say. And rather than dress these students down, at each turn where one of these Chinese students would raise an objection, now, now wait, um, 
uh, Dr. Hersenson, that's not quite how it went. You know, the, the separation with, with Great Britain, that had all been said, and, and Bruce would just calmly, methodically, year by year go through, that is not the history. And those students came away understanding not only their own history, but the importance of liberty and freedom in new ways uh, that they had never experienced before. And it took somebody like Bruce to be able, as, as Arnie and Ken have already said, you need someone who not only knows their stuff, but can deliver it in a way that it can be heard. And Bruce did that with students for years here. And even up until last year with, with these Chinese students who had never met Bruce before and had a completely different perspective on, on the way things had gone down, uh, they came away with a new realization because not only did Bruce know his stuff, but he could tell it so well. In fact, it was that talk that has led to his latest book, which I highly recommend, Profiles on Hong Kong, um, which again, always writing, telling stories and evangelizing uh, for freedom. Thank you, Pete. I, I, listening to you thinking about uh, Bruce evangelizing, I asked to be able to do this from my radio studio and have my microphone here because most of the people who are watching this will know Bruce from the television, from his long political campaign or from teaching, but actually the most number of people will know him as a radio talk show host of consummate ability and a pioneer in the industry. So Mark Larson and I have been doing this thing for a combined about a century, but I think we <laughs> both learned a lot from Bruce Hershenson and he knew how to do LA in the way that Mark Larson knows how to do San Diego. So I wanted to ask Mr. San Diego, mm -hmm to come in and talk about Bruce Hershenson on air. Mark? You know, what's really great about Bruce, I mean, no one's really mentioned his voice yet because there was that commanding, you could not ignore him in the room. I mean, he, and he wouldn't be, as you know, he wouldn't be shouting to the mountaintop unless he was on stage debating Tony or something. But there was that, that calm, like, I think the voice of God is here in the room with 500 people. Let me go and seek him now. Um, we have a lot of great experts, some of whom are on this, this, uh, broadcast, if you will, today. But if you really wanted to know what was going on, he was the go-to guy because he would also, uh, he, he had the ability for me when he was, even before I knew him, and I, I, I'm trying to remember when I first met him. I think it was sometime maybe late 80s, probably an event that I might have been I'm seeing. And then we got a lot closer and more frequent when he ran in 92. And, you know, we all know what happened with the dirty tricks as mentioned earlier. But uh, being such a Renaissance man as, as he was, um, he, he was a calming influence it's like you wanted to really know what the whole story was he had that and we could be all agitated like you realize that the communists are going to do you know we're all going to live under communism or whatever was freaking us out understandably at the time he would bring it in with that tone it was like it's going to be okay but we have to do this 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 and this and we have to do it consistently so through that he also became whether he knew it or not a mentor to many i bet most of those students that pete mentioned would say they felt the mentorship i felt it with him and when we were talking, really wanted to talk about something that was that was beyond the headlines, um, he would come on and talk about it with that, that, that great voice. And I first heard that when I came to uh, Southern California 45 years ago next June. Came on the covered wagons. It was great. Never returned the covered wagons. It's a simpler state then, uh, the, the opportunity. But I digress. Uh, he, he was the soundtrack of California. He's, he's personally the soundtrack of freedom. And what I especially liked and, and loved learning more about in later years with him was how plugged in he was to the U.S. space program. Because I'm chairman at the Air and Space Museum, have been for years. I've dealt with a lot of the astronauts with my personal company um, in terms of a lot of marketing with them and saving their legacies and building websites. So he, he spent a lot of time at Cape Canaveral with NASA and, and uh, the Air Force and doing some documentaries. The one he did on Friendship 7. Uh, John Glenn, I mean, that was a tremendous classic documentary in the earliest days of the space program. That was in the heart of the Cold War, as you all know. So for him to be able to do that, and, and he, he interacted and knew the original seven, that's something any of us baby boomers who were tuned into that would be like, I want to know that. Well, fast forward over the years through a lot of other associations, I got to know most of the original seven. I got to know a lot of the Gemini astronauts, and he did as, as well. And then many of the Apollo astronauts, including Gene Cernan, who was the last man on the moon 48 years ago this, this uh, December, last time, the most, the most recent visitor. Um, and there's a story that connects Bruce on this. I'm not just hawking a book like you might do. And you know, here's, here's a book. But uh, not available in any store anymore. 
but uh, he, well, he, what, what Gene said when he was on the moon in December of 72, and he was the last man, he, he said he, he was reflecting on the whole nature of God and what is it like when they're 240,000 miles away. And this is something that Bruce wrote about, and I'll, I'll share a couple lines in a second. But Gene said when he stood out there, he's trying to, trying to share what it meant, what it felt like to be one of the 12 humans who got so far got to stand on the lunar surface. And he was there with Jack Schmidt for three, uh, three days. He said, I felt like I was standing on God's front porch. So Bruce and I were talking one time and had, I had Gene when I said, hey, do you have this book? And so I had Gene in his autobiography inscribe that and you include that to Bruce, which and not knowing the kind of things that Bruce had written. In fact, here's uh, when he wrote about, uh, it's under the letterhead of uh, the Hershenson Motion Picture Productions, you know, that good, that good early 60s, you know, just a lot of letters, matter of fact, get to it. And he's just writing about it at Cape Canaveral. It sounds like Cernan. God created outer space. He painted it black and he called it the heavens. He built towers to reach the heavens. He painted them red and white. He called them the towers of Canaveral. I mean, that kind of stuff was just, and they talked about the draw, how it's not just the thing you write about and experience, it's an addiction. I know that big time. Anybody who grew up watching that or, or works within it and they've been blessed to know some of these, these heroes who also tell stories. A lot of what I dealt with with Gene Cernan up until he passed away in 2017 was helping him to, he told great stories like Bruce. He could go into a room and you customize it to, you know, if it's a, a room of five-year-olds, you figure out a way to reach the five-year-olds. But he would do that in a way that, you know, uh, it, it was interaction with Bruce sometimes, knowing his aff affinity to the space program. When I would talk to Cernan and say, hey, don't rush the part where you're standing on God's front porch, you know, because he would tell the story. You know, you, you, if you tell the speech the same number of times, it's just like, yeah, I was on the moon and I was on God's front porch. And then we move on to something. I said, savor the moment. So remember, I learned that from Bruce. Think about it, you know, let it marinate. Uh, in fact, a couple of times, Cernan would get off on, on a, uh, he'd say, well, uh, God's front porch, and then he'd pause and say, well, it depends. I mean, no matter what your vision of God, I said, don't put a disclaimer in there. Just just, just stand it, you know, do it the way you did. And that's the kind of thing that Bruce did. And uh, there was no, as, as you know, that, there was no topic, of, of, I think was mentioned other than the South Pole, but he had an opinion on that too, I'm sure, if he was here. But he knew everything and to go back to what was mentioned early on about not having the college pedigree early on when i found out about that long after i knew i just somehow didn't know that because that's that's my background too that so encouraged me because we just said you hit it and get it and you get into what fascinates you and you read and you you know to to see what he did without what you know i don't have a pile of doctorates or whatever to see the impact that to be in this group with all of you today, it, it's an honor to be in the middle of this. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I, last time uh, Bruce was on, I, I can't remember, it was in the last couple of years anyway. Um, and, you know, clearly he was he was getting older, but still it didn't matter because he was one of those people, as you know, there are a lot of people who can pontificate on things. He's the one, the minute he said, hello, you, you think, I got to take notes because this is going to be good. Can I, just you know, say, I don't want to miss it. On the space program, just to take the audience. Right. Is I said to Bruce one time, I said, you know, we all have regrets when we create something, a TV spot, a, a movie, a book. Some, when you did Years of Light and Day of Drugs, which is a true genius, for a nine-minute film there, I said, is there anything you would have done differently? And, said, and you look back, and he said, well, he said, I'll tell you. He said, when I was doing that film, I went through all of President Kennedy's material and everything. I had to select, and I had all this responsibility. And, so, and I knocked out, you know, he said that within a decade, we're going to be on the man, uh, be on the moon. Right. I didn't want to put that in because I thought, I don't know when this is going to be shown. I don't want to make him look bad because we're not going to have a man on the moon within a decade there. And I'm going to, I don't want to make him look bad. I want this to look good for posterity. And then years later, you said, you know, we did get a man on the moon there. I should have kept that in. Yeah, that's right. And of course, uh, the reason Kennedy mentioned earlier about how Kennedy you know, was anti-communist and how, what a different Democrat now, you know, all, all of the astronauts who have been friends of mine over the years, whether the Republicans or not, loved Kennedy for the fact that he stood up and said, we're going to put a man on the moon, didn't worry about the gender issue, we'll do it before the decade is out. And one of the lines he had in his Rice University speech was about how we're going to do it with things we haven't invented yet. That's an attitude. That's an American attitude. That's the kind of thing that, you know, no matter how insurmountable um, attacks on freedom by the communists or, or whatever the issue, 
there was always the feeling with Bruce that he knew the way around that. He, he knew if you follow what, what we're talking about, what he was laying out, um, you know, it would take a lot of work. It would be tough. Not a lot of sacrifice, but that that was, again, the soundtrack that's like the foundational, um, again, back to his radio and television. It's a it's a, a soundtrack of, uh, of America. And I, I'd like to close by asking each of you, Bruce Hershenson is in many ways the anti-Californian. He's the mm -hmm. opposite of every every stereotype about California, but he connected with a California audience in such a way that. Uh, prior to one other race that followed his 1992 Senate race, he got more votes than any second place finish than in the history of California. He's such an unlikely Californian. Why did he love or how was he connected with the state? Maybe I'll start with you, Ken, and give the other ones a chance to think about that. But having barnstormed with him, how did he come to love California? He's, he's a Milwaukee guy and he's the least Californian Californian I've ever known. I think it was the, from his uh, years in Hollywood. You know, he lived in Hollywood, and and uh, he he loved he loved the film industry, and and uh, he just connected in that way. I mean, uh, you know, his lunches at Musso and Frank's. I mean, Musso and Frank's is a, a to totally typical uh, L.A. Uh, eatery, and uh, where all the Hollywood people go, and. I think he just connected that way, and um, but uh, I, I think he, you know, he used to be a dreamer. Uh, he, he talked about how he would uh, sometimes he would lie as a kid. He would lay at night and, and just look up and dream, and and um, he, uh, he had California dreaming in his eyes. Mm -hmm. That's how he connected, I think. Uh, Pete Peterson, uh, did you did you think of him as a Californian? You've got all those flip flop wearing uh, uh, board short donning <laughs> students over there in Malibu, and then Bruce in his three piece suit. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> he always always came here. That his last time here, certainly suit and tie when he was here speaking to students. And as someone who is also not a California native uh, from the Northeast that wears more suits and ties than anyone around here. Uh, I always loved to see Bruce because he, he made me feel at home. Um, I think, it, you know, that last mark, remark that Ken just made about California dreaming, I, I, I really do see that about Bruce. As I said before, I mean, he was such a proponent for freedom. And that California at its best is a proponent for freedom. California at its worst is where we are today. Mm -hmm. Ernie, um, but, but so Ernie, much working with Buckley. Uh, so you were also an unlikely Californian. What was it about? No, I mean, I, I was born and, and raised here. And, and, and it, when I went to, to New York, the reason I did well for Buckley was because they, everybody else said you can't win. And I was t too stupid to know that. And <laughs> so we, we worked there. But as far as Bruce, you know, he wasn't your Beach Boys, health food, hippie kind of a guy there. Uh, but he had this libertarian instinct that associated with California. And the other thing, remember, this is a guy who, just like the, 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 the young starlet goes on Sunset Boulevard to Schwab's and is discovered there, this is a guy, you hear someone start at the mail room of William Morris. He was a messenger boy at RKO. And the old days, he worked himself up there, then formed an independent production company, he's involved with space and defense contracts acting there, uh, doing things for the government, then wound up with USIA. And finally, I'd just like to say we're short in time. I think some of you mentioned his voice here. I think there was, when, on, on radio, in some ways it's better than television because you have to hear, you don't have the visual distraction. And Bruce's voice uh, conveyed a mm -hmm. depth and a sincerity and a feeling and an intensity there that you were drawn to. I knew people who listened to him on Morning Drive, and they listened to every word they're lucky they didn't have a car accident. They were so focused on that. <laughs> and on television, in a different way, it came across there. There was, every word was meaningful. There's an intensity. And so I don't know about California, but when it comes to Hollywood and production values and PR and communications and imaging and so on, although he was unpretentious, in a different kind of a way there, he had an image that really stuck because it was authentic. Well, let me close there, Mark Larson, with you. On the radio, uh, since we're pros, we listen. And you can hear authentic, and Bruce was always authentic. Right. And you also hear kind. And I want to make sure we say, I think Bruce Hershenson was one of the kindest people I've ever known. And it came across yeah. when he talked to callers. I think it was mentioned earlier about how kind and how forbearing, and I, I, you and I wouldn't have done it, versus uh, the Democrats at Boxer in 92. That was the biggest measure of that. But he was always, if he had time, he would have time for you. 
he made you feel like you were the most important person as he was speaking with you. That's because you know, he wanted to make sure he conveyed everything. Um, if you needed something, he would, uh, he would have you, uh, he'd be ready to, to handle that. But I think echoing coming out from the Midwest, because I grew up in Rockford, Illinois, which is not far from Milwaukee. And, and many of us who came here as I did in the seventies or you know, before that was with, uh, with Bruce, um, it was a land of opportunity. I think California still is. I don't want to be the last taxpayer here, you know, if people keep uh, heading out, but, but it was that kind of promise. You know, for me, it was like, I, I remember coming to the state and thinking just a, how beautiful it was and how at the time it's like, we, I remember my wife said, uh, why do we have all these, uh, these freeways? There's, there's so much room. Well, six months later, it's who are these people and why are they crowding our freeways? But when we got here, it's like, this is fantastic. Yeah, we raised kids here and grandkids and, and the whole thing. And now I fear for their future because there aren't as many Bruce Hutchinson's around. There's only one. But in terms of people to to be heard in the middle of this, and, and here we've been in this many months of uh, COVIDian time where we have so many people getting used to and forced to get used to government dependency, which Bruce would loathe. I mean, in terms of just standing up for, you know, for the individual and for, for the Constitution and, you know, and for America, but that's the draw of California. I think it's still there, but it's flickering and we got to kind of, those of us who are still around, I think we take that to heart and do what we can. You know what Bruce Hurst, the difference is that people would listen to him and they would learn something. It wasn't right. opinion. He's, they'd say, I didn't know that. I, I, yeah. didn't, I, didn't, yeah. I found out this about China or Russia. Well, yeah. you just, all four of you have done that for everyone watching about Bruce. And uh, he was also always on his mark, always, always a professional. So we will wrap it there on our mark. I want to thank Arnie Steinberg and Ken Kachigian and Dean Pete Peterson and my buddy Mark Larson and the Nixon Foundation for making it possible for us all to collectively salute Bruce Hershenson, a gentleman, a Renaissance man, and a friend to us all. Thank you for participating and remembering Bruce in the very best way as he so richly deserves. Thank you. Thank you.